I believe with all of my heart that if there is anybody that should be alive, I mean really alive, really living, really enjoying life, that it should be believers. That if the, that that believers should have such a um, a vibrancy about them that people should be able to tell that they are believers because they have such a life in Christ that is not bogged down by by any kind of thing. And so, um, please, for the sake of the kingdom of God, and the sake of Grace Point, out there in our world, could you please? Please, at least act alive unto Christ and be alive and be full of life instead of being full of death. We have not brought death to this world. We have brought life, we have brought life to this world. And so, um, please, if, if you're out there in the world, bring life to this world that needs it so desperately. It's full of death. I mean, it's just full of death everywhere you go. I'm not sure who wrote the following words, but this story says a lot about mankind. When my oldest son was about three years old, I was outside doing some yard work one afternoon. I took Kevin outside to play while I trimmed the hedges. Holding his hand, I knelt down beside him so that he could look at each other face, so we could look at each other face to face. And slowly and carefully, I said, Now, Kevin, you can play here in our front yard. You can go next door and play in your friend's front yard. You can ride your big wheel up and down the driveway. You can go in the backyard and play with the dog or play on your swing. You can go back inside and watch television. You can stay here and watch me trim the hedges. These are all the things that you have permission to do. But you cannot go out into the street. It is dangerous there. You cannot play in the street. Do you understand what I'm saying? And the three-year-old Kevin nodded his head and said, Yes, Daddy. I let go of his hand, and he ran straight to the curb, put one foot in the street, and then turned his head to me and smiled as if to say, You foolish mortal. That is exactly, that is exactly what we have been plagued with for since the beginning of man. You remember, God said to God said to Adam, He said, I've placed everything in the tree in the in the garden for you to consume. Except there's one tree that you cannot you cannot have. And so what is the one thing that he does? He eats of that, and when he eats of that and partakes of that, then what happens is is that they have this, this bent or this, this kind of draw towards sin as opposed to righteousness. And so they, they are plagued by this, um, this terrible curse, and we have been plagued by this terrible curse that, that draws us towards sin until Jesus Christ sets us free and, and we are filled with the Spirit. Now, why would a little boy do that? And after understanding all the freedoms his father had allowed him to have, after all the things that he had gone through, after all of the things that he had said that he could do, why would a little boy do that? Why would he deliberately go out and place his dad to a place his dad told him not to do, go? Um, he did it because the little boy is kind of like so many people. They want to be free to do things their way. They want to be free to live by their own rules. They want to be free to be the ones who make the final decisions of what is right and wrong for them. We live in a society of no moral absolutes whatsoever. We live in a society that claims that each person has tailor-made rules for themselves. Each person has tailor-made rules to the point where other people's rules don't pertain to them. And so if they decide to go faster or if they decide to cut around 
and go around the police car, then that then that's their that's their right. That's their right. They have they are entitled to those rights. This reality that man often rejects the authority of his father lies at the very heart in the conflict between man and God. And God created us and he loves us and he wants to supply us with all kinds of blessings as he told Israel in Jeremiah 29 11 when he says, I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. You see, God's plan for you is not to restrict you God's plan is to give you freedom. God's plan is not to bind you up, but God's plan is to give you a freedom where you can dance and you can, you can play and you can, and you can enjoy life. But man too often looks at the Heavenly Father and knows what he's promising, but all they see are those restrictions that God, that, that God places in their lives. I think for us who have grown up within the church, uh, how many of us here, just uh, by a show of hands, have, have grown up within the church? A lot of us have grown up within the church. We have known the rules, we have known the regulations, we understand and know what we can do and what we can't do, what we can get by with and what we can't get by with, and we understand those things very, very well. We, we kind of precondition ourselves to say, hey, um, these are the things that you can get by with. These are the restrictions that God has laid upon us when really a lot of times God hasn't laid those restrictions on us at all. As a matter of fact, God has given us freedom in certain areas when, when we think that God has given us restrictions and really it's not God who has given the restrictions, that it is man's control over us. Now let that sink in for a second because it needs to sink in. To get God's best, they realize they have to go, to, they have to have authority over their lives, and many people don't want that. They want to be free from any authority so they can be free to do what they want to do. One preacher said this, before I went to Bible college, I spent a couple of years in a secular college and studied under philosophy professors who went out of their way to undermine the Bible in Christian morality, they would make fun of students who stood up for their faith. They would belittle biblical morality and declare that there would be no moral absolutes. There was no such thing as an absolute right and an absolute wrong. As I grew older, I began to realize that their teaching was absurd. When they declared there were no absolutes in life, they were standing that it was an absolute fact. In other words, they were absolutely certain there were no absolutes. Can you sense the absurdity in that? But I also came to realize that these professors really didn't believe what they were teaching anyway. The reason they worked so hard at undermining the religious upbringing of their students was because they needed to remove God's standards from their lives and replace those standards with standards of their own. In other words, they had to be in control. As long as God was in control of those students' lives, these professors wanted to be free of God's authority so they themselves could be the authority of their lives. That is like so many of us. Really, when you think about it, you, we ask ourselves, so who is the final authority in your life? Some may say, my wife or my husband or my children are the final authority in my life. They have the absolute last word of what I do and I don't do. But I want to tell you that in John 8, Jesus tells the crowd a very interesting thing. And he tells them how they can be free and how you can really tell if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. Listen to this. Then many of the Jewish leaders who heard them say these things began believing him to be the Messiah. Jesus said to them, You are truly my disciples if you live as I tell you. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Let me read that again. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But we are descendants of Abraham, they said, and have never been slaves to any man on earth. What do you mean, set free? Jesus replied, you are slaves of sin. Every one of you, and the slaves don't have rights, but the Son has every right there is. So the Son sets you free. 
you will be indeed free. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That irritated the crowd, you see. They got upset at that. So they, what they did was they went and they pulled something from in back of them that they had relied on for so long. And they said this to, the, to Jesus. We are one of Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. In other words, we are the chosen ones. We are the ones, and we have never been slaves to anybody. We don't sin. We don't do any of that because we are the chosen ones. We are the ones that have been declared righteous in the eyes of God because of where we come from. We, we are the ones. The Jews were saying, we don't want your freedom. No one has authority over us. We're already free. But Jesus was saying, no, you're not. Because there is, a, there is sin that, that, that is, has encaptured you. And so he says, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Jesus said in John 8, exactly what Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verses 16 through 22. And he says this, Don't you realize that you can choose your own master? You can choose sin with death or else obedience with acquittal. The one whom you offer yourself, he will take you and be your master, and you will be his slave. Thank God that though you once chose to be slaves of sin, now you have obeyed with all your heart in the teaching of which God has committed you, and now you are, are free from your old master, sin. And you have become slaves to your new master, and that is righteousness. I speak this way using the illustration of slaves and masters because it is easy for you to understand. Just as you used to be slaves to all kinds of sin, so now you must let yourselves be slaves to what is right and holy. In those days you were slaves to sin, and you didn't bother much with goodness." And what was the result? Evidently not good. Since you are ashamed now even to think about those things that you used to do. For all of them end in eternal doom. But now you are free from the power of sin. You are slaves to God. And His benefits to you include holiness and everlasting life. This is one of those upside down teachings of Jesus. It's kind of twisted in on the inside out. It doesn't seem to make any sense. But the Bible declares in no certain uncertain terms, everyone is a slave to something. And he says two things. He says, either you are a slave to sin and free from God, or you're a slave to God and free from sin. One of those two things. God's Word tells us if you free yourself from obeying God, you will be a slave to sin. You deny it, you fight it, you reject it, do whatever you wish, it's still going to be true. If you are not a servant of God's, you will be a servant to sin. Now the question I have is this, why would rejecting God and His authority in my life enslave me? Well, it's like saying, if there is no light in a room, you'll be standing around in darkness. Or, if you have no heat in your house in winter, you're going to get cold. If you don't have a God's kind of freedom in your life, you will be in slavery. And I can think of at least a few reasons why. If you have rejected God, that you will be enslaved in sin. First of all, if you reject God in your life, Ephesians 2.12 says, we would be without hope, and without God in the world, we would be without hope, without God. We are enslaved because we have no God. Now that sounds a bit redundant, but what it means is this. When you have no God in your life, what happens in your life depends solely on you, which is okay as long as life is going smoothly. And even when life doesn't go the way you want, even when life bumps you and bruises you and robs you of your dreams, it can still be okay if you're smart enough or strong enough or influential enough or rich enough. But if you're not strong enough or smart enough or, or influential enough, you're in trouble because there's no one to watch your back. There's no one at all to watch what happens to you and watch over you. 
Now, someone once commented to a preacher, God is a crutch, meaning anyone who believed in God was not strong enough to stand on their own. The preacher startled the skeptic by replying, yes, God is a crutch, but who isn't limping? Because we all are, aren't we? The Bible says again, and quoted it several times, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Which simply means that every one of us have come in here a little bit wounded. Or some of us have come in here a lot wounded. And we need God to prop us up, and we need God as a crutch. But I want to tell you today that until you give your entire life to Jesus Christ, that you will be only propped up for a short while. Until you give Christ the lordship of your life, you will continually be swayed and continually be enslaved by sin. Bertrand Russell was a famous skeptic who had no faith in the Bible or God in one of his writings, very candid about what a life without God is like. He wrote, The life of man is a long march through the night, surrounded by invisible foes, tortured by weariness and pain towards a goal that few can hope to reach and where no one can tarry long. One by one, as they march, our comrades vanish from our sight, seized by the silent orders of an omnipotent death. Brief and powerless is man's life on his and all his race. The slow, sure doom falls pitiless on the dark, blind to good and evil, Reckless of destruction, omnipotent matter rolls in its relentless way. For man condemned today to lose his dearest tomorrow, himself to pass through the gates of darkness. Now that is not very cheerful whatsoever. Second reason. People who reject God are enslaved because they have no reason to live. There is no purpose and there is no value. Say, well, I have a purpose to live. I, I have a job and all of those kinds of things. But what really fulfills your life? What is it that fulfills your life? The Bible tells me that you were, and I were created in the image of God and we are unique above all creation because we have the breath of God dwelling within us. But if God didn't create you and I, then we are merely a random collection of molecules. If God didn't create us, then we are a murky mix of mud and clay that has no more intrinsic purpose or meaning than that of a blade of grass. Essentially, that's what Romans 6 tells us. Preached on this years ago, a text, uh, this text years ago, and I remember being puzzled by Paul's statement. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. But now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God. I wonder how I could explain what is meant to be slaves and free all at the same time. Uh, I want you to know this morning that I have spared no expense whatsoever to bring you an illustration that I've brought you before. And I've brought you this car door. It's a beautiful car door. It's off of a Mustang. I wouldn't mind having that. All the all the car. So. This is a great illustration. This illustration, this car door is absolutely free. It's free. It's free from the body of the car. It, uh, it no longer is attached to the car. It has no attachment whatsoever. It's free from the car. It no longer has to go where the car goes and stop when the car stops. It just does its own thing. It's as free as it needs to be. It's free. Now think of this in terms of your own life. When you're not attached to God any longer. You're free to do and to go everywhere you want. And you're empowered to go and do whatever you want to do. Now, no one will ever slam this car door shut ever again. It's not going to happen. Unless, of course, you go and you put it on a, on a, on a new car or a different car. If, if there's a car that's damaged, or if there's a car that's damaged and you put it on there, then all of a sudden it's attached again to the, to the car itself. 
So no one will ever shut the car door again. No one will ever catch their seatbelt in it when they close it. No one will ever roll its window up and down again. In fact, you probably couldn't even if you wanted to. I'm not sure. Does that work, Chuck? If you can roll the wind? No, I don't think it will. Nope, it won't. Guess what else you can't do? My dog, I love my dog, Luke. My dog likes to, he likes this window rolled down. And he likes to sit right there when, he rolls it, when you roll the window down. And he sticks his head right out of here. And then my dog is so gross, he drools on my car. But you see, this car is free from that, or this door is free from that. There isn't going to be any dog drool on this, this door ever again. It's free. It has, it has, it has freed him itself of everything that being attached to a car could ever imagine. Um, it's absolutely positively free. And it's absolutely positively worthless. No one will ever use it ever again because no one wants it. Unless somebody wants it, if you want it, you can have it. If not, it'll sit in our garage until we have to throw it out unless I use this illustration again. It is now worthless and it no longer has any earthly value to anyone whatsoever. I'm just wondering, if this thing could have feeling, I'm just wondering if it could have feeling if it would want to be attached to the car again. If not, it's going to sit in a garage, or in a dump, or in Brussels, or wherever it is. It's going to sit there all by itself. Nobody's going to pay attention to it. Nobody's going to open it. Nobody's going to shut it. Nobody's going to use it. Nobody's going to abuse it. Nobody's going to drool on it. Nobody's going to do a thing. It will just sit there. I just wonder if this thing had feelings if it would want to be attached to the car. Have you ever lived your life unattached to Jesus Christ? Where you didn't know where to go, you didn't know what to do, you had no worth, you had no value, you just kind of went through life, just kind of getting through life the, way, the best way you possibly could. You just kind of got through. You just kind of rolled on through. You just kind of got through. You just kind of did your thing. In fact, now you didn't have any, any expectations of you. Nobody ever said, you know, you need to act like a Christian or, or you need to really shape up or you need to Why? Do you realize that because this car, this, this door is here, do you realize that it's in church this morning? This, this is in church. Had no decision to come to church or not. Wouldn't it be amazing that if, if individuals were like that? <laughs> Nobody has to tell you to come. Nobody has this feeling that you've got to. Why, this thing is absolutely free, but is absolutely worthless. I'm just wondering, when we are slaves to sin, if sometimes that we are worthless to ourselves and to a society. Interesting thought. Is the feeling of worthlessness and empties that enslaves those who have rejected God. It is the feeling of worthlessness that we have that when we don't accept God into our life, what, what is it that we're living for? 
They're enslaved because they have no God and no hope. They're enslaved because they have no purpose or value. They are enslaved because without God, they are held captive by their sin. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Not only does sin control the lives of people who have no God, sin condemns them. There is no way to get away from their sins. And without God, there is no forgiveness and no way to remove their past deeds, thoughts, or their words that they have. People are reduced to trying to balance out their sins of their past with whatever good deeds and whatever good actions they can possibly do. But you see, you cannot do enough to balance it out. You cannot have the right intentions and all of those. You can't have that. Because there is only one person who has paid the final price for your and my sin, and there is only one person who has paid the final price for us having life and having it more abundantly, and that is Jesus Christ who paid it with the blood of himself. At odd moments, their sin crowds into their mind and remind them of their shame. The worst of it is if they sin too much for them to reasonably think they can work it off. Um, some have been there. I've been with individuals who have thought to themselves that they cannot work it off, that they've gone too far, that they've done too much, that they possibly couldn't do enough to work it off and so they give up and they just live life and they just kind of squander through life just hoping that we get through in ancient rome this is gross in ancient rome the romans had developed a particularly horrible way to deal with murderers they would take the murderer and tie him face to face with his victim and he would live bound to the rotting corpse of his victim until he himself died. Without forgiveness of sin, there was no way for a mortal man to escape being face to face with the torment of their past unless they allowed God to free them from the horrible curse that they now have. The Bible tells me that Jesus came to die for us so that our sins could be removed. And Romans 6 tells us how God intended to do that. You see, no longer do you have to come face to face with the sin that you have in, the, in your past life. No longer are you strapped with it as a corpse in front of you all of your life. But you are now free from that and God has freed you and we need to live in the reality of that freedom that God has given to us. Listen to this. Soak this in. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We therefore buried with Him through baptism into the death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead though through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with Him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. It's kind of an oxymoron, really, when you think about it. When you think about when I first came up here, that really what Christians should be known for is their life. I mean, we should be, shouldn't we? You said amen. You, didn't you even clap to that? You might have clapped to that. That was so good, you might have clapped to that. And I said, but you see, the only way that we can live, you guys, the only way that we can live a life in Christ Jesus is to die to ourselves. And that's the only way we can live. Old timers, 
Old timers used to call it death root holiness. In other words, you can't live until you've died. And that's true. You cannot live until you've come to the point in your life where you have just said, God, I surrender my life. And whatever I am and whatever I'll become and whatever, I surrender that to you, Jesus. And Lord, would you live your life through me as opposed to me trying to live my life that is full of death and me just kind of puking that out into a, into a world. Could you do that through me? Could he do that through you? Could he live his life through your life? Could you see go out into your world and people see the life that you live is not the life actually that you're living, but it's the life that Christ is living through you. You want to talk about self-esteem, that's God-esteem. I don't know who I was talking to the other day, but they said, what I need is a new self-esteem. I said, no, you need God-esteem. You need God-esteem. Because this self-stuff isn't, isn't doing you too much good right now. You need God-esteem. That is so true. Heart on.